Okay, we're live. Good evening. Hi, all. hello. Hey, hello. Good evening. Everybody, welcome to the GC Foster College of Physical Education and Sport. This is a panel which serves to talk about the pathway to elite performance. It's Saturday, June 12th, and we know there are lots of other things that you could have done, but thank you for joining us. We want to thank our host, Mr. Cliff Allen and his team, and we have a well-established panel here, which we'll introduce in a little while but we thought that we should give some people some time. We know you're watching the NCAAs, you're watching the um, Euro 2020 football, lots of good sporting um, things on. And we know you would normally have better things to do on a Saturday at 6 p.m. in Jamaica or 7 p.m. And those of you who are staying up in the UK and across Europe to listen and watch, now, following a successful 2021 Boys and Girls Athletics Championships in Jamaica, which took place uh, May 11 to 15, where, as always, there were outstanding performances on the track and in the field. Can't leave out the field because, you know, in the last couple of years, we have done that. Some outstanding performances include Alia Francis within the Class 1, 200, and 400, Shante Foreman in the high jump and long jump, plus... She ran a fantabulous leg for the 4 by one for St. Jago to win. Javier Brown from Jamaica College, uh, in 15 hours, competed a double, 400 meters and the 400 meter hurdles. Newcomer Lavania Williams, uh, dominating class three. And then Stets, whatever St. Elizabeth Technical High School is doing through their coach, Mr. Renardo Walcott, is getting results. And of course, how can we forget 10.63 last week about this time? That's what we're talking about from Shelley and Fraser Price. Now, that is a summary of what happened after a year's break. Uh, and because of COVID, you know, life is slowly but surely returning to normal. The Summer Olympic Games will be on July 23 to August 8. And Jamaican athletes are running into form. That's my moderator um, privilege. The model is not one size fits all though. And so there are a few points that we'd like to make before we get into this conversation. Now, as you can see from the panel, we have from zero to 100 in terms of years of service in the business. And we want you to understand that we're targeting the athletes who is willing to go the extra mile. Knowledgeable coaches, structured programs, scope of work to improve talent, and a number of other things. Um, and just before we start, there's a poll that we'd like you to take so you can log on and see, because we want to know who is watching, who is listening, and so on. This panel of Jamaicans is unmatched and could line up against any major sporting organization anywhere in the world. So we have the, the leader of the GC Foster College, Mr. Maurice Wilson. And he has a national honor, OD. Then we have Honorable Mike Fennell. Um, he's the global sports leader extraordinaire. Honorable Glenn Mills, coach of some of the world's fastest athletes. Uh, QB Tegobin, International Athletes Manager. Now, QB has been here from way back when, and he's still very much relevant. Adrian Laidlaw, who is not new, but from the MVP camp, and he's now one of the world-renowned international sports agents. And the poll is on screen, so please indicate what you are so we can know um, who is watching. We have Dr. Kevin Gwyn Jones, noted sports medicine practitioner, and he is also a sports administrator. Now, I don't know if Dr. Jones wants me to tell everybody, but he was part of the team that orchestrated the COVID protocol panel for, well, track and field, but it has served as a template for sport and other major events in Jamaica. We have Ms. Olive McNaughton, who is a marketing and travel planner, and she's now a sport realtor. And she'll tell us more about that. Marlon Gale is an educator and coach. And Marlon, before you joined us, I understand because you coach the um, things in the field. Why? Anyway, we won't go there. <laughs> I'm your host, Carol Beckford. And throughout this conversation, you will listen and hear views and will understand why this panel was assembled. Thank you for joining us. And we hope we'll offer you tips along the way 
and how you can handle some of these challenges. Now, as I said earlier, um, we have a decent, extremely um, popular and well-noted team, administration, education, uh, track and field, coaches, marketers, sports medicine experts, and so on. So please feel free. Now I'm going to go age before beauty. So we're going to start with Mr. Fennell as the former JOA president, head of Commonwealth Games and so on. Mr. Fennell, um, speak to us about your experience with regards to transition of junior athletes into senior programs. Thank you very much, Marguerite. I hope you can hear me. Yes, very clearly, sir. Okay. First of all, thanks very much to the hosts for inviting me to participate in this webinar this afternoon. It's a conversation that's long overdue. We have talked about it unofficially in corridors, on the track and all over the place, but nobody has really put such a conversation together in a formal way as we are doing this evening. And I welcome this. We have a distinguished panel and I am I'm honored to be sharing it with a very, a list of long list of very distinguished persons. Let me just say that as we have all discussed over and over, we have had a lot of concern about this, and hopefully out of the session this evening, um, we will get some direction as to what next steps ought to be taken to see how we can better um, address the problem or the concern that we have. The other thing is that this has been labeled, and I would suggest we, we, we think of the title, because we use this term, it has been used for many, many years, of elite athletes, but I think the word elite um, conjures up a number of other things and perhaps we need to think of a, uh, maybe a better way of describing what we're talking about. Um, the next point I want to make, and I'm very quick and I'm just drop, dropping some points because we don't, we don't have a lot of time, that whilst we're talking about in the sport of athletics and Jamaica, this is a matter that affects all countries. It's not just here alone. And interestingly, um, Pan Am Sports, which is a body responsible for all Olympic sports in the Americas, have just recently launched a new product, which is a junior Pan American Games. And it seeks to address matters related to that transition. Those junior Pan American Games, of which I was a part of the launching of it, um, should, have taken, should have taken place in September in Cali, Colombia this year. It's been postponed till the end of November because of various things, to, the pandemic, etc., and the problems that are in Colombia. But certainly it is a games that seeks to address in a specific way, that age gap or when people stop performing as a junior and don't know whether they want to transition to the senior or go on to other things. And the last point I want to make is if we're addressing this in the context of uh, a career path, a part of the career path of a young male or female athlete, then we as leaders have to spend a little more time in defining that path so that they can have a clearer picture of what it really means to them, because they're the people affected. And I think that we have not, apart from individual mentoring, and a lot number of us have been involved in mentoring and coaching and, and, and guiding youngsters on an ad hoc basis, but we now need to see whether there's a better way to, to formalize this so that, like in any other business, career counseling, um, career description of the path, and what is necessary to pursue this and whether a career in athletics can be pursued alongside another career which will carry them after their athletic period is over. But we have all joined in talking to athletes over many, many years about what happens next. And we have not had a consistent picture across the board, nor have we um, addressed it in a, in a professional manner, it has been more a conversation than a professional guide. So I just dropped those few points in, um, Madam Moderator, because I know you've, you're, you're running to a strict time schedule. All right, thank you, Mr. Fennell. Of course, the GC Foster College of Physical Education and Sport has a very, what I'd call adventurous leader, but he's also very, very strict but he take risks and um, the college is over 40 years. They continue to train some of the best 
although he's listed as a special guest on the flyer. I wanted him to give a quite a, 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 just a little synopsis as how the college has transitioned and continues to help to really work on, as Mr. Fennell indicated, not just track and field and not just Jamaica, but how they continue to serve the region. Um, let's welcome Maurice Wilson. Thank you very much, Carol. And uh, I would have had to prepare a script because I could go on and on and on based on what GC Foster would have accomplished in Jamaica. Gerald Eugene Foster, best known as GC Foster, was a Jamaican sportsman who excelled at sprinting, cricket, and tennis, and later became a well-known athletics coach and cricket umpire. The institution named after this noble man continues to transform the coaching, teaching, and learning landscape for over 40 years. GC Foster College continues to play a pivotal role in sports development, particularly in track and field. It is interesting to note that at the recent concluded Boys and Girls Championships, the coaches of the winning schools were GC Foster College graduates, and incidentally, they were also roommates at college. Additionally, up to 60% of the coaches that represented the top 10 teams at Boys and Girls Championships were GC Foster graduates. The institution has prepared some of the nation's distinguished leaders, sports administrators, coaches, and sporting personnel. Presently, the institution has some of the most highly trained technical staff in the Western world. In looking at the top 10 salaries for elite sports athletes in the world for 2019-2020, track and field salary was not featured. This should indicate to the audience that for an athlete to earn as a professional in the sport, he or she must be listed as one of the best in the world, or at least in the top 10 rankings. The role of GC Foster College is to assist and guide young athletes in charting the pathway to elite performance. In the charting of this pathway, the institution, as would have mentioned by Carol, has been fortunate to attract some of the most experienced, distinguished, and knowledgeable panelists to guide us along the journey. I want to use this platform to welcome all again. And I will just take a few minutes to introduce our moderator, Carol Beckford. Carol has spent 32 years as a journalist and has covered sport, news, and entertainment in the global space. Based in Jamaica, she has traveled widely to present at workshops, conferences worldwide, where she has participated as a speaker on several topics on sport management, sport marketing, and branding. She covered football, cricket, basketball, hockey, netball in her earlier years in the business and writes guest columns for a wide variety of publications globally. Some major work done by, from 2000 to present by Carol, IOC course director and adjunct lecturer of sport management and sport marketing, Marketing Media Coordinator of Kingston City Marathon in 2019, Manager of Marketing and Communications, Cricket West Indies, Film Commissioner, Jampro Jamaica, former publicist, publicist of the Dr. The, the Most Honorable Usain Bolt, Media Manager at Jampro, author of Jamaica is in Sport and Tourism 2016, Keeping Jamaica Sport on Track 2007. She has two decades of experience in sport administration, where during those years, she served as president of Jamaica Volleyball Association and sat on organizing committees for regional and international games in a variety of sporting disciplines. She has been ranked in the 100 most followed sports professionals on Twitter. She's an avid fan of NFL, NBA, NLB for at least three decades and enjoys reading and watching television. And finally, I know I've been long. I will further add, Carol Beckford is a Ferncourt High School graduate, former head girl, and member of the school's challenge team. Thank you very much. I thought when I made Mr. Fennell speak before you, you would have not done that. Anyway, thank you I very could, much. I, could, I, 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 I got the cue, but I had to say what I had to say. OK. All right. So okay, after, after Mr. Fennell gave that um, opening, I figured I would go to the Honorable Glenn Mills next because Glenn would have coached at the high school level and would have 
created Racers Track Club and then, of course, had the ability to transform some of the youngsters into elite performance. Glenn, give us a synopsis of, of what your experience has been over the years. Thank you very much, um, moderator. Um, the, looking at the title, Pathway to Elite Performance, um, this is a very wide um, topic which um, could take all afternoon to, 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 develop, to go into, but I just quickly want to look at the athlete leaving high school um, and the pathway that is available um, here in Jamaica. Um, one, the athlete has the, the opportunity to take up a scholarship, mostly at the U.S. universities, um, basically where they have um, four years to continue their development in the sports while pursuing education. The second option is a part-time student, a professional, and, and being a part-time student, um, especially if they remain here in Jamaica. And three, a full professional, um, which basically is a full-time job. And the athletes who decides to, to take up number three, um, what I find is that most of them do not understand what it is to become a professional athlete and what the professionalism demands. And um, one of the things I try to pass on to them is that you have to understand that you have made a decision to earn a living from track and field as a professional athlete. And um, as a result, it requires you applying yourself as you would do at a, um, a job at the a work. Job. It's not a part-time occupation where if you choose to train today, it's okay. And if you don't tomorrow, it's okay. And you can't be making appointments at training times, etc. And so they have a lot of difficulty with the transition from the kind of freedom that you have at the high school level. Um, as it relates to now becoming a professional athlete. A lot of them have not had any kind of preparation, um, physiologically, um, mentally, and otherwise, to cope with the sudden change of becoming a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. And so you find that the attrition rate of success is very low. Um, I have not a formal um, survey, but uh, less than 5% of them make it past the first phase. Um, when you look at the number of outstanding performances at the Boys and Girls Championship, and then you look at the amount to actually succeed at, as a professional earning a living from the sport, you will realize that the number is extremely small. Um, those who go to college and have the additional four years of development have an opportunity to decide during that, those years whether they want to continue after college to pursue a profession in track and field. Um, or they would want to, if they are successful with their degree, they would want to um, go and work in that um, arena. And if you look at the amount that go on scholarship and the amount to actually continue in the sports, you will see that the number is even smaller. The, the point I'm trying to make is that when an athlete decides to become a professional, um, a great deal of assessment and research into that athlete's um, development pathway and ability to be successful at the next level. Um, great attention should be paid because it's not everybody who run a fast time at champs is really designed to do well at the next level. 
because there are a number of, of factors that de determine the performance of a junior um, at a high level at the junior at the junior level and especially at champs where the the champs atmosphere and the whole champ cycle is such a powerful stimulus that it brings out super human performances for juniors at, at, at that level. But very few have gone on to reproduce that performance or even go beyond it um, in, in taking up professionalism. So the, the, the pathway is not an easy one. And um, I think a lot of attention needs to be paid to educating um, both coaches, managers, and athletes at the junior level as to what are the, the, the indications and what are you going to experience at the professional higher level. In the athlete also has have to make significant um, decisions as it relates to their career and the, selecting the organization or management structure that is going to guide that athlete, especially during the transition, is crucial. Athletes should gear themselves towards programs that have shown that they are capable and, and has the experience and have produced um, athletes at, at the elite level. Um, basically a proven track record because um, a lot of nurturing, a lot of uh, training and expertise is needed during the transitional period, which is very difficult, whether you are at the university level or straight professional, um, you have to make ensure that you are well informed and well equipped to, to, to take up that path. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Mills. Um, you have opened up certainly a massive can of worms, but it's a good way to introduce QB Segovin, who has been an agent for as long as... QB, how long have you been around? Um, close to 40 years. But QB would have gone, would have been part of teams that nurture from the tender age in high school all the way up to the elite. And QB, the question I want to ask you is that how has it progressed or changed in the last generation? In, in 30 years, what are some of the things that you have seen change for the better during the period, even based on what Mr. Mills just said? Um, good, good evening, everyone. Um, can you hear me, uh, Carol? Yeah, man, clearly, yes. All, um, all protocols acknowledge to everybody, and I can tell you, I, I can see why this panel is such an extraordinary panel. The knowledge that has come before my speaking now is incredible. Um, I, I can tell you 49 years ago, my life changed tremendously. I was uh, packed off to university. I went off to university to study um, sociology and political science and ended up 49 years ago uh, having to deal with an, an athlete being a roommate that came back from an Olympics that civil rights and um, uh, terrorism was a very big part of. And in doing so, my life changed because I had to help that roommate of mine in education and in sports. He was a fantastic athlete, a Jamaican athlete. And um, uh, 49 years later, I'm dealing with the same thing. I think it's all about education. And I, I hope that on this uh, particular web here, there are a lot of young coaches that are listening to uh, the panelists here who are saying the right things. I, I, I think it's, it's the things that Coach Mills has said and, um, and Mr. Fennell has said are very important to an athlete uh, uh, being uh, or deciding whether they want to be a professional athlete. Uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of misinformation is out there a lot of uh, people uh, seem to think that being a professional athlete is, uh, is, is so easy to become. But I think, I think the most important thing 
for young athletes of a high school level is the way that they are parented. And I think the way the young coaches, you, you shouldn't just want an athlete to be a super athlete. You should want an athlete to be a rounded person. You should want an athlete to be educated and, and understanding what they're going. Uh, I think somebody said maybe, I think it was Mr. Wilson that said, maybe 10 or more athletes make it. So I think I, I, I was a product of education and I, I say education is one of the most important things for young athletes because not everyone will make it. Not everyone will have something to fall back on unless you have an education. I personally advocate that young athletes, like Coach Mills says, goes off to a four-year university because I think it's a good transition for them to decide whether they can become a professional athlete after that. Many young athletes and very, very few and far can make the transition from being a, a, a high schooler to a professional athlete. They have to have better attitude. They have to be rounded. They have to feel that they're not that they're entitled to anything. And this is the, the kind of situation that athletes come to me with, you know, all the, all the wrong things, all the wrong ideas of being a professional. And I think Coach Mills broke it down very, very clearly because he totally understands at all levels, all levels, the, uh, what it is to become a professional. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much, QB. I think I'll go over to the medical aspect now because so many of the things that the athletes go through are, in this case, although it's physical, a lot of it is also mental. And, and while Dr. Jones would have been able to understand the basics of the sports medicine and how he can manage athletes for preventative things. There are also some other things now, especially during the pandemic, which some of the mental things came up. Um, Dr. Jones, how has your experience been in the, the fact that you, you have dealt with youngsters, but in that transition, how can you say that they have grown or not as they get into um, elite performance or professional track and field? I can uh, thank you. I'm excited to thank the GC Foster um, group for inviting me to take part in this um, elite panel. Um, in terms of youngsters making the transition to um, elite athletes as adults, one of the things that happens as a youngster is that as they grow, they don't have to do much to do well. So each year, as they go from year to year, even if they don't train, you will do better. You know, the thing is that though that the dynamic is changing for them from um, class three all the way up to class one. In all those growing years, each year they get heavier, their limbs get longer, and they get stronger. And um, with training, training is trying to use to enhance these, these attributes that they have. So when they get to an adult though, they lose all of that, all of those factors in youth that help them to do well. So in youth, while they're growing, all their hormone levels are high, their growth hormone levels in males, their testosterone levels are higher than they are in adults, and all the other factors that are necessary for growth and putting on and putting on muscle mass, et cetera, are higher in that age group. So when you train a high school athlete, you're dealing with all of these positive effects that are associated with growing. When they, and so what happens a lot of times that um, when they do very well at the high school level, mentally a lot of them think that it, one, it comes easy, and then two, they think that it's automatic that because they were outstanding as high school athletes that they will be exceptional athletes um, at the professional level or when they become adults. And a lot of persons that support these athletes, family members, coaches, and so forth, buy into this and they, they want to reap the benefits of the phenomenal success of a lot of these high school athletes um, when they become adults and thinking that it's just a natural thing that they will become as great athletes in adulthood as they did when they were, um, they were competing at the junior level. And um, that is one of the transitions that always hits them. When they reach the adulthood, they realize that from year to year, whereas as a young athlete, every year you, you automatically get stronger. Even if you don't train, you're automatically stronger, you're automatically faster, and generally automatically bigger. When you're an adult, 
all of these anabolic hormones levels that were extremely high when you're growing are now normalizing and they don't change from year to year. So the only way you can get better as an adult is not by just being alive, but you have to train and you have to stay focused. Um, so that is one aspect that um, takes place. And a lot of times, um, mentally, there are a lot of negative um, attitudes are reinforced by individuals who think that, um, well, ultimately think that it's a given that they'll do well as an adult. So when they go to like certain camps and they're training and they're not performing well, they start to say things to the athletes' heads that, oh, it's the coach, it's this coach, and I need to move to another camp. So then you get athletes skipping around from camp to camp, looking for the quote-unquote coach who will help to get them to that next level. But a lot of times they need to look within and realize it's their own focus and um, their attitudes toward training and so forth. That will make the difference mm -hmm. to enable them to make that transition. And um, that's, the, that's kind of one of the main, main um, physical things and mental things that happens between the high school athlete, the one that the growing athlete and the adult athlete. Um, right. The other thing as well, one other thing I was trying to mention is that some of them, a lot of times, youth tends to hide a lot of technical flaws that the athlete might have, whether it be physical, um, they might have flat feet, they might have a limb length discrepancy, or whatever. they might have some kind of a physical abnormality that is impairing them from doing well. But while they're growing and so forth, their body compensates for it. When they get older, when they become adults now, they don't have that compensated factor. All of these flaws that they had then that they never took care of then come out in adulthood. And then you're trying to correct these factors then. It's a lot more challenging to correct them as an adult as it is as a child. All right. Thank you very much. One of the most important points made, you know, Mr. Mills, I think, said it, that when you're in school and you, you pretty much all said it, you get things done for you. You travel as a team, even if you're an outstanding athlete, you're still part of a school or, the, or a college institution. But when you go to the professional level, it is you getting up to go to work in the morning. It is you driving, if you have a car, getting picked up, that kind of a thing. And probably now is a good time to talk to Olive McNaughton, who has been organizing travel and logistics and will eventually do things for investment for these youngsters. When you make that transition, what are some of the things, Olive, that you would say to a youngster who plans to go this route to prepare themselves to get into that aspect of it? So we have pretty much talked about the physical, um, how you parent, you know, how you coordinate in a, in a community. What then is the level of planning that you have to put in gear to know that when you make that transition, all those expenses become yours? Olive? Um, good evening. Thank you, Carol. Thank, um, good evening, my fellow panelists. Um, I was, uh, when Maurice Wilson sent me the WhatsApp to say, Olive, can you join this panel? I said, oh, I don't think so, because I have such, it's the, like, fellow panelists are so um, well known and educated and esteemed. But as Albert Einstein said, he was, um, I am passionate, I'm not, I, I have no talent, I'm just cur passionately uh, curious. And so I've been passionate about sports for years, from my high school days at, at the Queen's School and moving on to university and then started out mentoring several of these athletes and going to major events. Mr. Fennell gave me my first opportunity to work as media at Commonwealth Games in 2006. And there I went as a uh, media and fan and mentor for these athletes. But over the years, I have gone into sports travel and tours. And I have been, I have had to work with high school teams to, to book and plan trips to Carifta, Pen Relays, and then um, also have these athletes move from being in high school where their teams and their schools plan their trips and pay for it and organize everything to them for them. And then I've had to work with teams moving to these major events, Commonwealth Games, Olympics. And of course, you know, I also plan these events for um, 
groups and teams to go to these events. And it involves a lot of planning and logistics. Now these athletes are moving from a position of schools planning and organizing from them to managers and agents um, planning and organizing and coordinating. But it takes a lot of logistics to do that. These athletes now need to recognize that these expenses are now theirs. And even though it is coordinated and planned by their managers and their athletes and their, and their, their, their agents, these expenses, and it takes a lot of coordination because you now have to plan to ensure that your visa requirements are in place, your passport is in place, and all of that. So these athletes, to get to elite performance and ensure that they, I, I want to just put in that elite performance, meaning moving from high school to a pro athlete to elite performance is a process and it is not going to happen overnight. And so some of the coordination and the requirements in travel and, to and, and logistics that enables them to get to those track meets, those, work, the, those Diamond League events involves a lot of logistics and they now need to be able to plan how they pack that bag, how they move from taking that bus and running to school to now um, planning their itineraries, ensuring they're going to the right airports and just the right attitude of coordinating their logistics to get them to those venues that they will now perform at an elite level. So it takes some time and some logistics. I do believe in the education that they should take the time to get nurtured in, in, in getting the skills, life skills. Education is key, whether it's ed academic education or acad skills education, to transition from that high school, to transition in organizing and planning and coordinating, getting to that event, because it's no longer the school planning it or the teams planning it. You now have to take yeah, yeah. responsibility for your, um, your getting there, whether through the right systems and agents in place, but you have to take ultimate responsibility as well. The senior athlete, the senior professional in that they need to be able to organize, getting to the airport, having all of the visas and all of those things and don't take it for granted that that the agent or the manager must take responsibility for it. And they must be able to be fairly independent that they have money to be able to, as a backup to get them to, from the airport to the to accommodation and to ensure that they follow the, they're able to manage their logistics and planning to get them there. And as well, to how I will also ensure that we have the fans in the stands supporting these athletes, because it's also important for them to see the Jamaican flag, the Jamaican fan base, they're supporting them and supporting Brand Jamaica. All right, thanks Olive. So pretty much what we have heard, get the right people to work for you, go to school, um, learn the issues. I, I can't, let me tell you, the issues are plenty now. When, when QB was in college with his friends, it was more about civil rights. We still have those. But there are so many other issues now, and there are so many other um, equality, equity, and all those things. So lots of things to, to think about, and then the responsibility becomes yours. But let me go back. Um, I'll probably, between Marlon and um, Adrian, let me go with Marlon first. Marlon, you are now pretty much an active, younger coach. What is the mindset of some of these youngsters who are raring to go, and who would think that, yes, this is it. I jumped or I ran some really great times at Champs and I want to get in the picture. Before Marlon comes in though, guys, remember to take the poll. And if you have questions, send them in for the panelists so we can, so we can actually answer. We have added some, some other parts and sorry, we left out a particular one of them, but yes, please take the poll. Marlon, um, what are some of the issues that you have with the youngsters who think that this adrenaline rush is there and I'm ready to go? T tell us what's the mindset of the current athletes. Pleasant evening, everyone. Um, and I take the compliment of being the youngest among these brilliant minds, many of whom I have emulated over the years. And um, certainly I feel privileged to be a part of this group. Um, currently, the mind of the the 
no athlete, the new athlete, the athlete moving on to college or the athlete making um, waves or improvements in his class um, tends to always want to do better. But sometimes one of the things that sort of affects the transition is the subculture that affects the team culture. And the subculture many times is what um, interferes with what a coach wants to ensure that the athlete, of course, is making the progression based on scientific knowledge. The subculture sometimes um, causes the athlete to do things outside of that. And over time, it certainly can interrupt um, a team dynamics. I want to segue um, to what we do at GC Foster so as to encourage our young coaches um, as it relates to child development, coaching um, athletes for human performance and so forth. In our specialization um, classes, we try to encourage our coaches, many of whom are coaching in some of the top schools right across the islands now. And I, and, and I must thank Sir Wilson for giving me the privilege because certainly I have garnered a lot of um, experience from doing that. We want to ensure that whenever we prepare our coaches, they understand the role that they play in the development of the athlete. And it's not just for the athlete to be their best in one or two years. Longevity is important, and it is one of the things that we preach um, in our program. And of course, they too have to be prepared to deal with the, the, the changes that will happen um, in the athlete's um, career, student athlete career throughout high school. And as they make their transition to the next level, of course, especially when you're at first year one, you want to take the time out to spend more time preparing them for the next level, not just by preparing um, them to run, jump, or throw, but certainly so certain responsibilities that you probably would have been talking to them about from previous classes, that they understand that whenever that time comes, there is not you won't have the coaches behind you, as many persons would have said before, and that it is going to take a, level, a different level of responsibility for persons to be successful. Yes, we have also used the examples of many who have gone on before, who were exceptional at champs, who were exceptional at, uh, at junior um, championships and so forth, youth championships and so forth, what happens um, thereafter. So we, are, we do that um, with the hope that with the team that works with the athlete, everyone would pretty much um, contribute and understand that every role is vital to the athlete's future success. And certainly, Longevity, as I said before, is one that we always have to try our best to contribute to, to ensure that that athlete after high school has at least 15 years, like um, Mr. Bolt would have um, as a result of careful planning um, application of the theories and methodologies of um, training as it relates to the, in the principles of training and as it relates to the individual capabilities um, of the athlete. So we, we always try to ensure that we put the athlete first, his development, his future first, rather than the ego and the bragging rights of having a champion. All right, thanks. So Adrian, you get the last word. You probably have been somebody who has, you get them when they're transitioning in, they have already passed the high school level. Um, pretty much you have, you have really dealt with the older athletes. Uh, what has been what has been their mindset coming in and how have you helped to clear the pathway for them? Some who were not necessarily at their best, but you have converted a few of them. What has your experience been like as an international sports agent? Adrian? Where is Adrian? Adrian gone? No, where is he? All right, all right. He may have jumped off. Um, the, the truth is Jamaica continues to lead the way and we welcome our friends from the Caribbean who have joined in. I see some people from Trinidad and Tobago and I think Antigua, that's our online. Um, let me come back to you, Mr. Fennell. When, when they come to the international games, as an administrator in the business, what are some of the questions you get asked? Because one of the things, they think it's easy because Champs has been in some ways extremely good for us, but it has also been very bad. It has set us up as a country. 
um, what are some of the questions you get asked and how have you really said to them, this is what the process has been? Um, moderator, let me just say that I never cease to be amazed by the some number of questions that are being asked, which shows uh, a lack of preparation and a mindset in terms of going to a games and what it all means. Um, there are many, many issues and we get um, questions about uh, resources, um, why can't this be done, who can help them and who cannot help them, etc. Um, there's no shortage of questions. And it appears to me that when you bring them all in a village environment and they're there and they have time on their hands and they start to talk and some leaders can relate to them quite easily and they talk openly. Um, it's amazing the knowledge gap about what it takes. Earlier on, uh, Mr. Mills was talking about the support system that's necessary. They don't have a clue about the long list of support system that's important for them, even at the school level. And, and, and athletes don't know that there are costs involved in all of that. This is, somebody else is bearing, they're isolated from that in the school because the past students and all those support um, areas is taken care of fully. And the athlete does not understand any of that, which leads me to the question, and I don't know who can answer this, Madam Moderator. In every school, we talk about from the school system to the elite, but in every school nowadays, we have counselors. We have career guidance counselors and so on. Do any of them have on their agenda career guidance in pursuing a career in sports, not just as an athlete, maybe as an administrator or, or some other, way, other support system? Is that anywhere in the guidance of our youngsters at school, where they're approaching champs or, or approaching the period when they will be leaving school and going to the outside world? Is that, to my mind, that's a fundamental question because we do not regard sports as a very important social um, operation. We regard it as a, an event thing. Uh, and the event is finished, you finish with sports. Sports, as an athlete, sports as an administrator, are no legitimate professional careers. Are our schools in the preparation of youngsters, guiding our young people as to the pathway that they can follow when they leave school? I'm sure Mr. Mills or or Mr. Wilson would be happy to take that on, particularly the school leader, who I'm sure would be happy to talk about that because the introduction of physical education, even as a subject at the CSEC and CAPE levels, showed an indication of what um, that in its essence could have been. But not just to those two, Madam Moderator, but somebody like Olive, as we all know, I'm sorry to call it, Olive is very close to our old school. And I'm sure she, because of her constant and sustained involvement in sport, she uh, gets asked by the girls at the school, either they're athletes or otherwise, things that she has to answer. That's not a part of the overall preparation for them for, for, for the outside world. So I'm interested in the answers. Uh Carol, mm. can I go ahead? Yeah, I, man, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking at the chat forum and I, I'm seeing where some of our distinguished guests, they're asking a lot of questions, they're making a lot of suggestions. But one of the things I've noticed is that the psychological and mental preparation is being mentioned a lot. And it is extremely important that the focus is on this aspect of the preparation. At GC Foster College, in collaboration with the Ministry of Sport, we have introduced the Optimization Hub program for psychological and mental training of the mind, mental resilience, or resilience, sorry. And what I've noticed, those persons, I believe, that are benefiting most are not the persons who necessarily are involved in the sporting arena. In other words, there is this disparity, this disconnect of combining the physical with the mental. And a lot of times, the persons who have the most influence over the athletes must be blamed. And I will start with the coaches. I think it is extremely important for coaches to educate themselves and in doing so, also educate the athlete's mind, not only the physical being. And so the parents are, must, be, must be involved. The parents must understand 
that they have a critical role to play in the development of the young, youngster. And it has nothing to do with finances, really. A, a role can be just giving mental support, being there for the athlete, not only when they are doing well and they become popular. And so it is important that the, the total training of the body and the mind um, is, is, is given serious consideration and the influencers, and I'm using some of the words, I'm plagiarizing some of what I'm seeing in the chat forum. The influencers of the youngsters must understand that is an all-encompassing um, process that is going to make the youngsters do well. Mr. Fennell, um, your answer, your, your question was answered. Um, Olive, talk to us about, you know, as somebody who works closely with particularly a girls' school, um, how has it been? Because we find that sometimes we are afraid to answer the questions. And I'm going to bring in QB next because he's close to the, the seat of power where, and I'll let Olive go first. Well, Girls. as Mr. Fennell said, um, going back to Queens after 1978 victory and going back to Queens as a mentor and a mother and a manager of the, the sports, assisting with the sports program, there has been little that has been put in place to assist the athletes to be able to manage that transition from high school to, 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 to the elite level. Fortunately, some of my athletes that have passed through this, the Queen system and have gone on to reach the Olympics have managed fairly well because they have focused on their education. But in terms of having a guidance counselor assisting those athletes, it is not there at the Queen's School. What you find is that the schools, the, the athletes have become so dependent on the coaches to mm -hmm. be their counselor and their guide. And they have depended on the parents are almost have been because you have you have so many single family situations where these young girls are coming out of single family homes and they have become dependent on the school giving them the lunch or the food and then the coaches putting some things, so many things in place for them. They come taught dependent on the coaches into making their decision, making their travel plan, deciding whether they go to, to school locally or abroad, deciding which scholarship they take up. And so this, the athletes have become dependent on the coaches and not able to make decisions for themselves. So we need to put more, I mean, the old boys and the old girls um, try to do assistance, the financial support, especially the old boys. But we have those old boys, the, 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 the boys transition to the elite performance. You're not seeing that happen either because I don't think we have a proper mentorship and support systems in place to support these athletes. I also find that the athletes going off to schools abroad, I think those schools have more in place to assist and support athletes as they transition at this high school level. Because based on my experience in having to assist athletes who have been left by the wayside because they, in their final year of school, they got injured or got hurt. And so there's no assist or support, whether from our organization or, or, or ESOs or the JTRIs or anybody to assist that transition more. There's nothing in place. So you have had to, I don't think persons taking up scholarships locally versus going abroad. I, I think the schools abroad have more infrastructure in terms of medical facilities, in terms of giving them support, in terms of advice. Um, if there's a, not everybody is going to be strong, but academically, but they ensure that those athletes get their degrees and they not, most, more, more of them come out with a degree at the end of the day, utilizing their talent of to get them their scholarship and get their degrees. And so therefore it is important to have that infrastructure in place, those system in place. And I don't think we have enough of that in Jamaica to support the athletes moving from the pro level to the high school to the pro to the elite level. We need much more of that in place, that mentorship, the, that management to guide the athletes. 
And yes, you have the parents, and parents also need a little guidance and education sometimes because they themselves don't know the process. So they rely on the, the coaches, they rely on the managers and leave their children sometimes to, to fend for themselves. And we don't have that infrastructure in place to assist the students moving to that level. And that is why sometimes, as we, you know, Mr. Mills say, you have those that go to school, those that try to be part and part, and some that are pro, but the, without the right mindset, without the right infrastructure in place. So a lot of these athletes will not get to the elite performance and just take a first contract and maybe not or go to school and never go on to excel in elite performance. All right, thank you, Olive. Guys, remember to take the poll if you're on and we thank you for the comments. QB, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, after all these years, Give me a kind of definition of the best suited athlete for you. Forget what your performance is on the track. Marlon spoke about longevity in, in a comment. And I want you to give me the definition of what and who you believe are the athletes. Not naming names, but what are the qualities and characteristics of that junior that is to make that transition. Give me some words that you can describe them. You're on mute. Um, unmute your mic, Cubit. Oh, sorry. Unmute. We're not hearing you. Sorry. Um, host, can you unmute, Mr. Sigubin? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, okay now. Yeah, yeah. We can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, as I was saying, um, Carol, it's incredible information that is being uh, uh sent out by all these panelists. But all roads, streets, avenue lead back to education. It's all about education, Carol. And, at, you know, you can have the most talented athlete. But as, uh, um, but, but as Olive says, if you don't have the, li the, the, the life um, skills, they won't make it. They will not make it. Because some of them think they're entitled. They come into the sport thinking they're entitled because they're a professional. They're entitled. They, they never adapt. They never come with an open mind. They never adjust to what they have to because the, the, at the high school level, the coaches, they're, they're focused so much in champs and winning that they don't have the time to really, including the parents, help these young athletes to become total human beings in the sense. And they come with bad attitudes. They're disrespectful. They're rude. You know, uh, they come with a lot of injuries. I mean, I, I am speaking raw. I'm not going to, I'm not going to cherry coat it. I'm going to tell you it like it is. I presently represent nine athletes. And the reason I represent nine athletes is because not because I can't represent 40, but I'm very selective because of all the things I've just said to you, because a lot of them fall by the wayside because of all the things Mr. Fanella said, all the things Olive has said, all the things Mr. Mills has said, and, and, and Mr. Wilson, because we're living it every day. We're living it every day. And the worst thing can happen is the misinformation given to them by old boys, old girls, people who don't know anything about what's going on on a daily basis in the sport. You have all these people with misinformation in their ears, telling them this, telling them that, you know, just disruptive. And that's the problem. A lot of them will not make it. They will not make it because of all those things that go, go, go by the wayside. Life skills, life skills. It has to start at the high school level with the parenting and the coaches. And they, they emphasize so much in winning that the kids lo lose out in just being a total human being. In my opinion, uh, this is my opinion. No, absolutely. And I, I understand. Mr. Mills, uh, you, have, you have been there across the board in the schools. Um, while QB didn't quite tell me the definition of those youngsters, though. What is the solution though, Mr. Mills? I mean, you, you were there at the high school level. You have, you know, you have come really full circle. You have also managed trap meets and you have seen them come, seen them go. What are some of the things that we really need to get done? One as a nation and one as an industry because we essentially are the people that are managing the industry. What do you think needs to be done, sir? Well, um, I think that a lot needs to be done in terms of um, educating both coaches and athletes. And mm -hmm. um, in this aspect, it needs um, 
a leader, and uh, I would think that the National Association, um, the JTRAs, could undertake, along with ESA, um, could form some alliance and put together uh, a program that you, they could um, invite coaches and athletes, and um, from time to time have seminars and and you have um, speakers, a uh, guide giving out the correct information and guidance that 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 would spread that kind of gospel into the the system. Um, this would help to counter the, um, the the false information and misleading um, guidance that a lot of them um, receive. And I think it thrives in the atmosphere of ignorance that um, a, a lot of them do not know because there's nobody who have the experience and knowledge in a formal situation disseminating this kind of information to them. And so uh, obviously they're going to be left to choose their own pathway and, and believe what they think sounds best uh, are from those who have their attention the most. So I, I think that it needs to come from a more formal situation where I think the national body could um, get involved in not just waiting for them to come forward to select them on national teams, but to, to create a program of interaction and involvement from the infancy so that as they grow, they grow within that kind of environment of getting the correct information and guidance. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, Dr. Jones, you know, so we hear about education and a lot of even some of the misrepresentation that comes on is really about the physical status of people. You made some very valuable points in your first part and I want you to repeat them, but in the context of now that there's a recommendation that there's an alliance, what then are some of the basic steps you think that we should take in understanding? Because what I find even as a former physio teacher myself, a lot of our students don't understand how their bodies work. And so even in, in, in the growth, the length of your limbs and even the weight and so on, how then can that be part of an overall education program to guide our athletes and the people that train them? Unmute, please. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, one of the guides that um, we try to recommend to coaches and to athletes is that um, all athletes are different. All athletes go to their growth spurts at different points in time, etc. So a lot of time coaches come and they have one program that they administer to all the athletes. And then an athlete starts to get hurt and then um, they have it as athlete being soft and athlete being this and athlete being that. Um, instead of looking at the program and at the athlete's development, they just dismiss the athlete and say that pretty much that is the athlete's own fault. Um, so what a coach has to recognize that when an athlete is going through a growth spurt that they need to kind of back off of the training because their growth plates and their attachments are where the muscles sort of um, are to the bone because the cells are dividing more rapidly then they're more easily damaged. You know, so you definitely don't want to be lifting too heavy or doing too much explosive stuff and kind of back off on the workout. Um, as the, and as especially during the growing years, if a girl stop growing around at age 14 to 15 and boys 17 to 18. So you definitely do not want to overload them or work them too hard, especially in those growing years, because like I said, they will get stronger just by being alive, just by going to bed in the night and wake up in the morning, they are a better, stronger human being. So the coaches have to recognize that um, each athlete is different. If you see an athlete going through a growth spurt, and they all of a sudden they shut up, you need to probably back off of their training regime and not work them as hard. Definitely in lifting weights. Um, I'm working with, um, I mean, I've been advising um, a friend and um, coach who has um, one athlete who is significantly taller than the rest of his other athletes and he keeps having back problems. And through discussion and training modification, we've learned to back off of some of his 
um, his, um, his training program and focus on his core strength more than the other athletes that are with him. And then he doesn't um, participate in his, in his event as often as other one because he's much bigger. So therefore the stressors on his limbs and uh, where his muscles attached are significantly greater than those of the athletes that are smaller than he is. So don't just um, dismiss an athlete. The athlete gets, so don't just dismiss the athlete. Try and look and see what it is about that athlete that it is that you might have to address differently. And yes, you have your general programs. However, for each athlete, you might have to focus on a different aspect. So one athlete that might have to be working on his hamstring strength more than another athlete. Another athlete might have to be working on their core strength more than another athlete. And one, another athlete may need to work on their flexibility more than another athlete. And it varies. So no, there's not a panacea. There's not a one program fits all. You have your general rules and principles, but you need to, as you go along and as you learn, um, learn more about athletes and sort of develop, develop programs or tweaks a program that are specific to address the needs of that particular athlete. All right, so the all important question is now going to come up, and I'm oh, anybody can take this. What I'm hearing all of you saying, important thing is education. We're obviously a sporting nation, despite despite our lack of ability to cheer them on, even if they're not winning. We are a country that depends on sport to get international branding. That said, what I saw in Champs, May 11 to 15. Reorganization of the schedule of champs and it worked. Champs ended at five o'clock or before. So that's one thing. Two, is it now that is it now time for a sport school, high school at the high school level? Is it time where we have something like what they the rest of the creative world is doing, where they have specialist schools to prepare prototypes to send them out? And anybody can take this question. Because ideally. Ideally, yes, we'll still have the inter schools competitions, but is it now time that we have at the high school level, because we are GC Foster and so on, that there is a school that looks after sport? Well, Carol, maybe, maybe I could start. I think in the overall plan of the government of Jamaica, there needs to be this kind of thinking. As we all know, in most first world countries, Australia, some countries in Europe, there are specialist institutions that identify talent from a very early age. And so when you have, for example, academies that Messi and, and, and great footballers came out of, and you'd see the amount of time that they would have spent in developing their God-given talent. Someone said it earlier, it requires experience and technical support not support that is not trained, support that is not, persons are not knowledgeable, but they are doing guesswork. And that is also a business. And we could even start with GC Foster College because I do believe that there is so much more that can be done nationally in relation to the institution. I think that we have not improved in relation to our specialist areas that we do well in sports, culture, and so on. And so there is a place for what you just mentioned. And I think this is the way we will have to go. But there must be an acceptance from the grassroots level. And again, I am seeing the, the chat forum and there are persons there that they are talking about it. The principals must understand the importance of sports as a career. ISA is seeing sport in a business way, in a business form. Someone also mentioned, this is not my words, that in, in America, the universities align sports with business. And so there's no reason why we are having these world-class performances and we are not putting the support in place for the youngsters. So when we talk about the education, the support must come from a national level. It must not only come from the coaches, or the, the, those schools that they, they attend, but overall, and, and again, I think Glenn mentioned it, there must be a formalized program from, from, from the different organizations, the JOA, the J3As, and all those other sporting organizations that can assist in doing the 
the total um, culturization of the youngster. Okay, Marlon, as, as a younger as a younger coach, what's your take on the the uh, the specialist school? I remember uh, Dr. Muggy Grime when we were talking about as these transfers some years ago. This was mostly about football. Brought it up said if we want to create athletes, let's let's manufacture them, but don't include them in the generic thing. That could be another conversation for the rest of the night. But Marlon, what do you think about a specialist school at the high school level? Well, certainly, I believe it is something that could work. But um, in in explaining it, I would like to also share my experience um, as it relates to the the Cuban setup. It is similar to what Sir Wilson mentioned about Europe. So in Cuba, you have A's and S's. So you have schools of initialization to sport. And you have schools of specializations to sport. One of the one of the problems with it, however, it, it develops what you call categorization, which means that the coach that is working at the initialization level and the coach that is working at the, is not the same coach working at the specialization level. So an athlete normally spends two years with a coach, one year to adapt, the other year to produce results. And one of the things that came out um, in my research then was that the athlete at 16 many times would perform bet far better than when he's 19 or in his early 20s. It's one of the reasons, also the contrast between their system and our system, why it actually worked, where an athlete was able to spend seven maximum seven years with his coach. The system, a, a specialized system, however, in, in the context of Jamaica certainly can work if we continue to do um, frequent, um, whether you want to call it seminars, workshops, and so forth, so as to remind persons of the roles and responsibilities that they have as coach, um, um, remind them also of the, the dynamics of child development. We have all said it. An athlete who is going through puberty certainly goes through different phases. I'm not sure. I know quite a few coaches pretty much would know that, especially those who would have done level one. They understand that because it was a part of their preparation as to if that is that knowledge is used whenever they are coaching and so forth. Because one of the problems, as many persons would have said in the chat, we, we saw the focus on winning rather than the development of the individual that ultimately contributes to longevity and relevance in the sport um, thereafter. So it is something that we certainly would have to look at and ensure that the, the right persons are there, the right system is there, and something probably we could have um, across all the counties um, um, across Jamaica, rather than having one, have three, because one of the things you also realize with Cuba, using volleyball as example, they have a perfect system of identification of talent and selection. You will not find a new talent in the primary school system or high school system that they would not have identified because it is something done systematic. And it is something that we would need to look at and understand that whatever it is we are doing, certainly it is for the for Jamaica and not um, for a particular um, individual as is sometimes the issue in some of the programs. But certainly, as I said before, it is it can work if it is done properly. All right, um, you know, you have, a paper. you have a paper to publish, Marlon, and, and I'm sure the, the college can support you. I'll be happy to support. Um, and let me tell you, the truth is, if we're going to continue in this vein where 25 medals is our goal at, this, at the Olympic level, and now with World Cup football for both men and women, I, I saw the, the Belgian blueprint and the point that Mr. Mills made, J3 is a GOA, it has to be the national federation. Um, what was the score in the Belgian match? I think they beat Russia three goals to nothing. Um, so th the truth is our national federations must take some responsibility for development. And even if they, as the schools don't want it, you have to, you have to get, get involved. And so that's, that's the ultimate. Um, I, I'll go back to Mr. Fennell though. Administration over the years, I think we have been stymied by a little process called democracy, where a lot of our leaders are elected through a process called an election. And so a lot of the development plans that probably were in place have not been carried out because different 
administrations have different focus. Mr. Fennell, as somebody who has led all over the world, not just in Jamaica, what do you think is the response from an administrative standpoint, how we can get around this, having identified that we are a sporting nation? Carol, you, you, you need a whole new seminar on that one. <laughs> this can't, I can't give you an easy answer on that because on the one hand, democracy is accepted as the fairest and best way to operate, but it's a, it's a humbug. It holds you back. And, um, you know, not everybody can have a, a leader like what they had in Singapore to cut through the cackle and, and, and progress the country without denying everybody their rights, because that is not always possible. That's a very difficult question to answer. And I don't think there's any substitute for that. We have to go through it. Uh, democracy and our various constitutions prescribe uh, a governance structure that we must respect. If you don't respect that, how can you respect the rules of the sport? You know, you, you have to lead, lead away with that. So I don't think there's any substitute for that. But what we need, um, as you would know, is the training of our sports leadership uh, through various programs to, to ensure that they understand the dynamics of the new today and the new tomorrow. And this is even going to be required with the pandemic because it's going to demand like in business and industry and agriculture, a totally new tomorrow. And that will be required right now. Um, so, you know, this is something that we need to look at. But could I make two other points since I'm on the floor? Um, sure. Firstly, we're talking about moving from champs and transitioning into other things. The problem is that we all see the country sees champs as a destination and not as a part of the journey. And, and even the media does not help us because they over glamorize the champs victors, victors with, without emphasizing the fact that they have not yet truly arrived. Yes, it's big in Jamaica. Now, how you get that balance, I don't know, because it's great for, for the event, it's great for everything else. But we need to ensure that. The, other point is that we need to, 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 to ensure that um, we cover another problem because there's a trust deficit between the advisors and the youngsters. And not only the youngsters, but the youngsters' parents as well. So you have different minds, different approaches. You're getting one advice from the coach, you're getting one advice from the friends, the old boys or old girls association, and the teachers, etc. We have to cover that there's more uniformity in the advice we're giving them because ultimately the young youngster is, is, is affected. And if we, we need to address that and find a way to address it. We can't do it this evening, but it is an important area to cover that trust deficit. And the other point is that we need to be able to, 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 to whilst people are doing well and they've performed exceptionally for their school in this thing we call CHAMPS, we have to find a way to let them know that if we're going to make that into a career. They have a different set of counseling, uh, one that they can trust and believe in and understand that that can lead them to other things as well. All right, thank you, Mr. Fennell. Some questions regarding the poll. We're just trying to find out who is watching, who is on, so, we, so that, that's what the voting is for. And we'll post the results in a second. Um, you know, Time flies when we're having fun and when good information and the esteemed panel I haven't been able to figure out. You have all made brilliant points, but it is just about 7.30 and we're gonna be, we're, try, we're gonna try to close another 15 minutes to ensure that everybody, but we, let's go back to the pathway. When we think of a pathway in Jamaica, you all know the highways. Remember we used to drive through the gorge into, into Mount Ross and so on. Now we have highways and so, we're getting to places quicker. And in 2021, there is a misunderstanding that there is a quicker way to get to the end game than we had before. Dr. Jones, I see you shaking and I'm going to start with you. From your perspective, and even if you want to share other things that the others have spoken about, what then? is your recommendation for a pathway um, if we had the resources? Um, you still have to go through the process. Regardless, there's no quick way to success. You still have to go through the process in terms of 
development, training, um, both physically and mentally to get to the end point. The, um, I want to mention something about the specialization, specializing early and these specialized schools. That can be a dangerous path to go down because studies have shown from that Major League Baseball and National Basketball Association that athletes who specialize early, who make it to the pros, they get injured more easily and they don't, their careers are shorter and there are different, there are different medical explanations to suggest why. One is that if you do multiple sports and multiple events growing up, you develop a lot of your other muscle groups and different um, and coordination and support, which makes you able to better cope with the sport that you're taking part with. The other thing as well is that if you start to specialize early, you have a high risk of them developing burnout, both physical burnout and mental burnout where the athlete gets fed up and no longer wants to compete. So at the high school level, I still think it's very important that we just focus on as broad a program as possible, allowing the athletes to enjoy themselves and develop naturally and not trying to force them down a rabbit hole of becoming a sprinter or a hurdler or a jumper or whatever, but allow them to develop and not make that decision until they are near skeletal maturity. Um, a lot of the athletes have done very well for us. People like Michael Holden, remember Holden was a decent four meter runner. Seymour Newman was a decent cricketer, was actually supposed to be faster than holding at the youth level um, as a pace bowler. And if you look in the NFL now, the top best young quarterbacks playing more than one sport when they're in high school. Um, Mahomes, um, more Kyler Murray, the um, Russell, um, Russell from um, the Seattle Seahawks, they all played multiple sports in high school. So this, spe this specialization school and so on thing can be very dangerous. You have to be careful. Look at all of the young individuals, especially the females who went to tennis academies, Jennifer Capriati and so forth, who were burnt out before they were 20, reached Wimbledon semifinals when she was 14 or 15 and so forth. You have to be careful. We're talking about these specialized schools and so forth. And if the school system as is, is adequate with the right guidance and um, coaches and so forth, informing themselves and guiding the athletes appropriately, um, it can continue to produce athletes who can do well at the highest level. If we have any potential PhD students in here, this is a nice study that we could use. I'm throwing out ideas for those of us who want to do further education. Dinsford, you asked a question about a national sports council. There is one. They have not met in five years. Um, five. Yes, 2016. Um, <laughs> I won't get. I, I I won't go down that route. But there 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 is a there is a group um, that was formed back in the 70s, and the successive governments have appointed various people. They haven't met in five years. Um, Fabian Paul is agreeing. The truth is, academies have changed, and so the specialized schools that that I asked the question about, was it necessarily the Gileads or the dancing? Because yes, I know of the burnout, but just to, re to form our own academies, to integrate and specialized schools now have as much an elite education program as possible. All right, any other recommendation? Because you know, we're wrapping up. So Dr. Jones, your final statement, just before we switch to the other panelists. What, as uh, I said, yeah. yeah, if you had the resources, what would your answers be? If I had the resources, um, to educate coaches, athletes, parents, and so forth in terms of the differences between the student athlete and an adult. I cannot overemphasize that point. Um, they're not young adults, um, so don't coach them like that. Don't give them these programs like the programs you give to adults. Allow them to develop, allow them to explore their options because when you look at the athletes who have done well in the world, Sebastian Coe, he was, he used to long jump, he ran long distance and so forth before he became the 800 meter world record holder back in the day. Most of your athletes who will do well in the long term are athletes who never, were never overly specialized or overly coached in high school and they developed later on. Not They weren't the best necessarily in high school, but they developed later on after high school. All right, thank you. Um, so there, the results of the poll, 
obviously there are more coaches online and we have teachers and educators watching. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so the coaches and the teachers, sports administrators. Ah, interesting. And we had a other, I'd be interested to know what the others are, but we won't get into that. Um, QB, as a long time, and Dr. Holt, I see your comments. You have been an integral part of sport. Another one that made a very good point about playing sport. When, first of all, the school that I went to, we had PE twice a week and we played everything. One of the things I taught when I was volleyball president, I taught the players dancing because I realized that although they were physically strong, they never had good coordination. But that's for another panel. Um, QB, I'm going to come to you as a long time agent. What if, if Adidas was able to be given an opportunity? I'm joking. As a, as a long time agent, QB, what are some of the things that you would want to see Jamaica get now into the next five to 10 years to make their program more successful for the all round thing that you speak about? Please unmute your mic, sir. Unmute somebody. Okay. Um, let me say. Let me say this, Carol. I, I might not be answering your question directly, but I've always looked at athletics as a triangle, where there is the athlete, there is the manager, there is a coach, with all equal angles. Um, I don't want to be very morbid, but athletics was dying before the pandemic, and it's dying right now. My advice to any coach. My advice to any parent is to send your kids to school. Let them have an education because as we all have said here, the education is the main thing. Listen, we lost our way in Jamaica in that we focus too much on champs. We focus too much on sport. We focus uh, too much on not developing the, the young adults as a total human being. And I'm being morbid, but it's the truth. The athletes are carrying the sport right now. Look, the last couple of meets we've been to, the athletes have paid their way by air. They've paid their hotel rooms and they're running for nothing just to compete, to get a time to go to the Olympics. No, there's no money to be made. This is the misinformation that young coaches and old boys and old girls who don't understand are saying to these young adults. I would say to the young adults, get your education. If you're offered a scholarship to go to school, take it. If you're offered a scholarship to go to junior college, take it. It ain't there anymore, Carol. It is not there. And that's all I'll say. All right. Thank you, QB. Mr. Mills, um, what, what would your legacy be in, in the sport of track and field and even some of the other sport that you have contributed to? Um, what would you want your legacy to be if you had the resources and you could make an adjustment to the current setup? Well, Carol, I, I would like to see um, a greater involvement in the development of our young sportsmen and women, um, especially from the associations. Um, I don't think they do enough um, to, to help in the developmental stage. Um, maybe it's a question of, of funds. Um, I think it's time for us to have a national lottery that, that, that funds sports. Um, but a, a lot of the, the coaches um, need equipment, they need support. Um, and they have a lot of outstanding youngsters um, under their care. And um, not many schools have the, the, the support that it needs to develop these youngsters. And so, I would love to see a greater involvement, not interfering with the, 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 the program, but greater support um, within the program. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Um, I see the questions online regarding, uh, let me see if I can respond. Um, there is a plan, um, Janet, there is a plan. So, uh, the recording will be available after it's going to be on YouTube. Uh, Jamaica does have the human resources, but uh, they, there's too much burden being put on our athletes and parents to develop. The truth is, is that our education system 
does not facilitate or see physical education and sport as part of its thing. It's called physical education for a purpose. But that's another discussion for another day. One of the good recommendations, we talk about the alliance between J3, JOA, and ISA for a more all-rounded program. QB, your points are well taken. You have always spoken very clearly and succinctly. Um, Olive, as we get ready to go to the to the Olympics, um, what are some of the challenges you see happening now after the trials in terms of visa? Just very quickly, tell us what are, because you're going into Japan, anything okay. you'd like to well, indicate as to you, us? Please? As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic will create a new dynamics about logistics and travel. Before, the athletes usually have issues with visas and passports and their itineraries. Now, this COVID passport that you're going to need is going to possibly become a reality. Athletes cannot. I got a call the other day where athletes had booked a, a ticket online and was stopped because there's no, you can't leave the US to go to Europe to go to by the US. So there are going to be challenges how you travel. So both, as you know, um, they are so Greater care is going to have to be put in place in logistics, planning, and travel for athletes to get from the Jamaica to, to Japan, whether it's, as you know, there are no fans going to be there, but even just to coordinate in the logistics of their accommodations, persons are going to have access for COVID negative tests. So it is going to be more more planning and logistics will have to be put in place for athletes and coaches and family and fans to move from home bases to wherever they're going. The whole thing of Europe at the moment is locked down. Um, you can't just move to Europe just like that without ensuring the country. You have to check each country what they have in place as their COVID-19 protocols. So it is, it is in, ensure that you have the proper structure in place to be able to manage and to find out what is happening in terms of the travel logistics very more so because of COVID-19 it is going to be more you're going to almost have a COVID um COVID passport to travel to go into hotels they require negative COVID tests you have to go into to be known if you have to go into quarantine when you're traveling so you're going to have to know to plan all of that logistics going into different countries what are the protocols for different countries? And I noticed that our athletes were moving about um, from country to Jamaica or to elsewhere, but some of those protocols were not being adhered to. But I think countries are going to now want to ensure that strict protocols are put in place, especially due to the pandemic. And of course, going to um, the, the fans, as you know, there'll be no fans allowed in the, for, for, for Tokyo. But hopefully for the next sporting events, we can have longer, greater um, support fans be there to support our athletes. Thank you very much, Olive. So um, Maurice actually gets the last word, um, but, and then I'll wrap up. But to, you know, to kind of bring him into the into the discussion, to close it, and to make his recommendations, we want to see him in the position as a leader of the institution that has almost specific responsibilities to train our technical uh, and administrative professionals in the business of sport. So while track and field is our focus, um, Mr. Wilson, what are some of the programs that you have in place, not necessarily to clear the pathway, but to make it open so people can actually see based on the discussion that we have had today, Mr. Wilson? Well, thank you again, Carol. We have a multiplicity of programs at the college and we continue to evolve. We start with 45 hour courses, whether it be in sports massage, um, fitness training. So we're giving opportunities to those uh, athletes who are extremely talented and those who want to choose uh, sports as a career to start at a point, whether or not they matriculate to the, the, the college level. We also have an associate's degree program in coaching, in sports massage and fitness. We go up to the undergraduate level in teacher training, physical education and sports. And we do have a master's program. 
I think the, the, the fascinating thing about the institution is that it facilitates all individuals from all walks of life. And irrespective of with which, which sport, there's opportunity for persons to excel, not only as an athlete, but as a teacher or someone that is involved in sports. I think the, the, the question that was, uh, uh, what was mentioned about um, specialized schools, I think there is some, some misinterpretation in relation to what I think was being asked. Um, I do believe that there's a place for our athletes who are 18 and 19 would have gone through the system and decide that they want to become a professional, the pathway to elite performance. That pathway must involve organized training. I'm not saying it must be systematic or it must be one kind of training because you're now 18, you're approaching adulthood and you have decided that you want to become a, a track athlete or whatever other sporting um, athlete. And so the proper support must be provided. The sports psychologist, the, the nutritionist, and all the other areas that will contribute to your, to your performance. Dr. Jones will tell you because we, 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 we communicate a lot. In relation to some of the injuries that we're seeing, some of the injuries are out of ignorance. And when we talk about the training of coaches, it is ongoing. It's a role for GC Foster College, but it continues to evolve. And, and just sometimes you are not able to capture every single one. Or their, their attitude or their philosophy is a little bit different. It may more lean to, to um, winning as someone would have said on the uh, chat forum. So it is important for us to identify at 18 and 19, coming out of champs, your final year, um, athletes, identify the persons who are experienced and knowledgeable that will provide the mentorship and the guidance in terms of education, in terms of rehabilitation, and all the other areas that can assist them in becoming decent human beings. I think if we are able to do that, it will be a win-win for all. And so we continue the process of trying to create social change by the starting of this forum. So indeed, I think this is a, a huge start nationally and internationally and we'll continue to do the work. All right, thank you very much. I, I have to make a special recognition to Simon Boyne, who it is now, it is what, Sunday morning in, in New Zealand. Simon is a former track and field coach, uh, a graduate of, of the parish of St. Catherine. I think he went to St. Catherine High and would have coached in Atlanta. And he's now um, doing very well in, engineering the, over in New Zealand. So Simon, thanks for joining. The, the, the discussions will continue, but one of the things in wrapping, in wrapping this discussion, and Mr. Fennell, you'll get the last word as the senior, as the elder in the group, but I want to say that if you have an athlete that is willing to go the extra mile, ensure that knowledgeable coaches and technical teams are around these people. Structured programs, training, and preparation. The support that Mr. Fennell talked about, that a lot of people don't know that where the support comes from. So despite the interference sometimes of some of those groups, there is support and athletes and parents and families must be aware of this. The competitions are national, regional, international, and they are professional competitions. And then you go ultimately to the world championship and the Olympic games. The scope of work is to improve your talent and to make you a better person to adjust in real life. And then there's my area, the brand development and the media training. That's a separate thing. Because now we see, right? Look at what happened in the French Open with Naomi Osaka and Roger Federer. And we can see. So even the things with the social media and so on, right? The incentives. So while there's not a lot of money in the sport, if you play your cards right, you can get incentives to be branded, all right? And there are lots of products and services out there that require ambassadors that you can earn so much more from being endorsed. The truth is, guys, once you get all of that, you will be recognized and rewarded by the system. So as I said earlier, this panel, and we thank um, Cliff for hosting us. But this panel, as I said, brought 
some really good discussions, the pathways or the pathway has bumps, it has curves and turns, but ultimately, if as a nation, we have the mindset that we will get there with a broad program in the high school level and with some specialized training. Mr. Fennell would have been, he has been called oh, to calling. solve, called to solve so many problems internationally. And sir, I give you the last word in terms of administratively, again, I want to emphasize what is it in addition to what Mr. Mills has said would be two or three things that we need to do to reassemble ourselves and look forward to the next 30 years, what we can do with sport, but specifically track and field in Jamaica. Well, Carol, you put me on the spot, but I can't answer that everyone, simple as that. First, first of all, I think this has been a fantastic event, a fantastic conversation. Where we expose a lot of things that have been below the surface, some on the surface, and we're really done a lot. But it demands a follow-up. And I'm going to ask the GC Foster College in congratulating them for initiating this program this afternoon. I'm going to ask them, no, I'm not going to ask, I'm going to demand that the GC Foster College has a follow-up session. Once they've analyzed all the suggestions and comments that were made this afternoon and the questions that were asked and some were not answered, to look at it and have a follow-up program which could be tighter and, and deal with those specific areas. Because if we do not follow up, this would be just whistling in the wind. It has been a great afternoon and talking about a very sensitive subject to which we need to find some answers, if not complete answers, where we go from here. I want to emphasize that the GC Foster College has played a critical role, but like all other tertiary institutions, they educate people who need to be trained in specific areas of sport after their university education. So we should not ignore that training. And Carol, you're in a very good position to do this because as you know, when we're discussing the sports master's program, we emphasize the fact that people may have specialist degrees in specialist areas, but nobody has any overall experience in sports administration that needs to be tutored and, and shaped. Yes, um, I do believe that there are many, many questions still to be answered. And I think that follow-up session will direct us and point us in a better direction so that we can develop a roadmap for this very sensitive subject leading into the future. And my last point is we also need to recognize that the pandemic that we have had for over a year now is going to show us some new opportunities of to how we need to go into the future and not just think it's a continuation of the past. This is very, very important. And I am very appreciative of the fact that I was invited to participate in this. And thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Fennell. Um your, 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 your words of wisdom continue to um, run through the minds of some of our people. And, you know, and I think it is important that the discussions we've had, um, the team that assembled this have all the notes and they will put together the discussion. And I guess we'll go back um, as the cricketers do to the joint table uh, and come back with some things. Um, Mr. Okonsaya Smith and Mr. Gale, the team at DC Foster, who relentlessly worked hard in getting as many participants as possible. Trinidad and Tobago, New Zealand, Antigua, our friends from the region, and I see the recommendation for a center in CARICOM. CARICOM now has a new Secretary General. Um, uh, she's a woman, so I'll see what happens. For the last couple of years, we have had very little out of them. I continue to say that, and I won't stop until I see results. Uh, Thank you very much, um, Mr. Wilson, for giving me this opportunity to moderate this panel. DC Foster continues to lead the charge as you should and as you will continue to do. And I hope our listeners and viewers, and I'll pick out Dr. Michelle Holt, you have been awfully quiet. I know you're helping netball and hockey, but we need you back in the business of sport, young lady. Um, come back and help us because the kind of diversity that was is required to make sports successful in Jamaica required all hands on deck. Again, thank you very much. And we'll hope, we're hoping, yes, yes, you're back. We're hoping that when we do this again, you'll all join us and spread the word. 
All right. Good luck to all the teams that will participate and athletes in the trials coming up the end of the month. And of course, we look forward to successful participation in the Olympic Games. And I must end by saying, um, Khadija Bonishaw, a product of St. Catherine, has now signed with Manchester City. And I think that requires plenty, plenty congratulations. Good night, ladies and gentlemen, and have a great rest of weekend. All right. And, and thanks to you, thank moderator. You. Thank, thank you, you all. Carol, and thank thanks. you, fellow panelists and listeners. Thank you very much for having.